second to let people kind of trickle in here and we will get started shortly. Welcome to our Baltimoreans and those far away. I know sometimes we're joined by people across oceans. Oh, hi. Hi, Gail from Massachusetts. Oh, we've got lots of different people here. We still got people trickling in, so. Um, we've got Detroit, New York, Montreal, Delaware. Welcome, everybody. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, sorry, I'm just going to close this window. Welcome to our Friday Virtual Histories program. My name is Molly Ricks, and I am with Baltimore Heritage. In 2020, Baltimore Heritage and the Baltimore Architecture Foundation partnered to host these virtual histories every other Friday. So first, I want to thank you uh, to everyone who donated to be with us today. Your support enables us to keep doing programs like this. Um, so a few announcements before we get started. In two weeks, uh, we will be joined by um, architectural historian Sarah Grosbeck to learn about the lives of Baltimore's 19th century ship cockers and their families. In the middle of the 1800s, this was a strong Black community with philanthropic organizations, education, debating societies, and churches. Uh, and this is a story that the Friends of the Ship Cockers Houses and Preservation and the Preservation Society uh, will tell through the ongoing stabilization, rehabilitation, and interpretation of the Ship Cockers Houses um, at 612 to 614 South Wolf Street in uh, Fells Point. So that uh, presentation is in two weeks here on Zoom. And now for today's presentation. Dr. Isaac Schoen earned his PhD in 2014 at the University of Florida and is an adjunct professor at the Community College of Baltimore County, the University of Baltimore, Morgan State University, and Coppin State University. Um, his research is on the archaeology and ethnohistory of the Caribbean and South America with a focus on public archaeology, developing inclusive and participatory methods. His recent efforts have been oriented toward integrating three-dimensional photogrammetric mapping techniques <laughs> with more traditional archaeological methods. And he also serves on the Laurel Cemetery Memorial Project Task Force and has been instrumental in bringing the story to light. So um, one last thing, uh, if you enjoyed today's presentation, um, please join us in person on May 12th for a speaker program exploring Laurel Cemetery in more detail. And you'll be able to view the Laurel Cemetery Memorial Project's traveling exhibit and enjoy a light reception to talk to those who are on the task force. If you have any questions during today's uh, presentation, please add them to the chat or the question and answer box. Um, and I'll say thank you, Isaac. And with that, take it away. All right. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you very much for having me today. Um, let's see. Very pleased to present this research to um, all of you. Thank you all for being here. And because we will be giving the sort of more in depth, longer talk on May 12th, um, today I'm going to to present the story in the kind of most simplified way possible um, about Laurel Cemetery. And I also want to just acknowledge that I'm a very small part of a very big committed team on this project. And uh, there are a lot of people whose contributions um, uh, made this story and this knowledge come to light. And um, uh, like I say, I'm just one part of that. So I've listed some of those names here, but um, to everybody on the Laurel Cemetery Memorial Task Force, thank you all very much for your efforts. So first off, um, I wanted to talk about where Laurel Cemetery is, lest you think that it's in Laurel, Maryland. It was in Northeast Baltimore um, on Bel Air Road, right across the street from Clifton Park. And you can see um, that uh, now there's a shopping center there and how the cemetery got to be covered by a shopping center is part of what I will be talking about here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about this history and significance of uh, the cemetery when it was in operation. I'll talk a little bit about the um, circumstances surrounding its demolition, um, the contentious circumstances, I suppose I should say. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about our efforts um, doing the archaeological and historical research to figure out um, what parts of the story 
uh, needed to be corrected or updated and what we've learned uh, from those efforts. Um, so the cemetery was uh, incorporated in 1852. And when it was incorporated, um, that, that year is um, significant because that was the, the year that Maryland passed the law allowing private corporations to own cemeteries. Um, and there's some possibility that the area was a burying ground prior to that, but it was uh, the cemetery corporation was formed in 1852. Now, at that time, and you can see here highlighted in the first um, uh, part of this bill, it was stipulated that only free white persons could own shares in the company. And that, um, uh, that fact about Laurel Cemetery made it so that there, throughout the entire duration of when it was in operation, there was a disconnect between the private owners of the corporation and the um, predominantly African-American community who were utilizing the cemetery and burying their uh, families and, and ancestors there. Um, at the time when it was incorporated, it was the first non-denominational burying ground for um, Baltimore's Black population. And for uh, uh, half a century, it was the premier place where people in Baltimore um, uh, went to for burial. And it was very successful and very popular um, prior to um, the end of the 19th century. Um, what happens at the beginning of uh, 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 excuse me, the 20th century, what happens at the beginning of the 20th century is because it was a privately owned cemetery, it changed hands, it changed ownership a number of times. And the different owner operators um, had different interests and different motivations that meant that the care of the cemetery was not always the priority. And um, by the 1930s, uh, a a, a uh, changing of hands um, happened again, where it came to be owned by a real estate agent in Baltimore, whose primary interest was in the value of the land. And at, at that point, there was a, a sharp decline in uh, use of the cemetery and, and uh, specifically maintenance of the cemetery. Um, but before we get to the, the sort of decline, I want to talk a little bit about why this cemetery was so significant and what makes it different from, um, from other cemeteries. Uh, Baltimore um, has a number of cemeteries that have existed and that have been closed down over the years, but um, there are a number of things that make this cemetery special, one of which is the sheer number of people that were buried there. Um, uh, contrary to what was reported in the newspapers at the time, our research is starting to indicate that there could be upwards to 40 or 50,000 individuals interred at the cemetery. Um, and secondly, the historical importance of some of the individuals is uh, um, uh, severely underrepresented, I think, in um, histories and narratives about Baltimore. And as this quote from Lily Carroll Jackson indicates, um, some uh, extremely important figures in the community of Baltimore and um, civil rights activists, teachers, uh, lawyers, doctors, um, people who really paved the way for, uh, for the community in, in Baltimore at the time, all chose Laurel Cemetery as their burying ground. And the community really showed up to commemorate those individuals for the, the years when it was still in operation. Um, just one example of one of these figures is Daniel Alexander Payne. Um, and uh, he was um, a bishop for the African uh, Methodist Episcopal Church, the sixth bishop, and um, uh, an extremely important figure um, working towards abolition and working uh, on, on behalf of education in the community. And he was sort of beloved in, in the community. And one of the things we found in our research was a document in the Frederick Douglass papers that were archived of a pamphlet that was distributed at the building of the memorial for uh, Daniel Alexander Payne, which you see here, just the cover of. And what this document shows is that for a year after his death, they uh, cr crowdsourced funding essentially to build this memorial. So they formed a, a, a essentially a nonprofit organization, raised money for, for a year, uh, gathered these donations to buy this marble stone monument, and then uh, got together and Frederick Douglass was among the speakers who, who talked at this um, uh, uh, 
when they um, erected the memorial, but you really get a sense of how important um, he was as an individual, but also how important commemorating the past was by, by reading through this document. And it, this is just one of the few sort of things that, that gave us a real insight into the importance of the cemetery when it was in operation, which I think in modern times might be a little bit lost on us. I think the cemetery has lost some of the uh, importance that maybe it once had in the past. Um, the other uh, point of significance for the cemetery when it was in operation was the fact that um, at least 240 uh, soldiers in the USCT were buried in the cemetery. And for those that don't know, the United States Colored Troops were the first uh, African Americans who were uh, allowed to join the army and they fought for the Union to liberate the South in the Civil War. And shortly after the Civil War, in, um, uh, in South Carolina, um, at the burying ground for several of these colored troops, people started um, showing up to decorate the graves with flowers. And that tradition spread um, uh, around the Eastern United States and came to be known as Decoration Day. And just a few years after that first Decoration Day in South Carolina, um, they had a Decoration Day at Laurel Cemetery for these USCT troops. And Decoration Day is, is sort of transformed into what we now know of as Memorial Day. But initially it started as a, a commemoration for these troops who had fought to uh, liberate the South and to uh, end slavery. So the, US, the United States government actually purchased a plot at, at Laurel Cemetery, and it was known for a time as Laurel National Cemetery. And um, I just highlighted a couple of articles from The Sun that talk about the turnout for, um, for this Decoration Day. Uh, and what would happen was they would start in downtown Baltimore and have a parade, a procession all the way out to Laurel Cemetery on Bel Air Road. And reportedly between eight to 10,000 people would show up uh, for this uh, uh, celebration. So it was, and, and they would have orators come and give speeches and, and have music and parades. And it was sort of a very big event. And just to put that in context, uh, at the time, 10,000 people would have been 25% of the African-American population in Baltimore at the time. So that's quite, um, quite large. Um, what happened though was that, as you can see here there uh, in this headline in 1880, there was a, uh, what we would call today a riot where the police tried to uh, uh, arrest an individual at the, um, at the proceedings and ended up shooting a, uh, a, uh, uh, someone who was uninvolved with that, just a, a uh, um, someone who's uh, uh, an innocent bystander. And this, this created this, this big uproar and this big panic. Um, and one of the things we think happened was that as a result of this, the US Army felt incentivized to move that cemetery because just a couple years later, they moved those graves from Laurel Cemetery to Loudoun. National Cemetery, where they are still today. Now, we can't prove that those are directly related, but that uh, um, the timeline certainly seems to indicate that. So that brought an end to the Decoration Day. Um, one of the things we've been doing for this project is compiling biographies of a lot of the individuals. Um, I don't have time uh, today to go into that, um, um, but um, we've been working with the uh, African American Historical and Genealogical Society, and specifically Dr. Donna Holly, who's been compiling biographical information for a lot of these individuals. And so um, you can learn more about that on, on May 12th. I want to talk now, though, about how the cemetery came to be demolished, because it's such a significant uh, piece of history for Baltimore. And the other thing that I want to point out is that there are other cemeteries that were contemporary with uh, Laurel Cemetery that are still maintained, that, that you can still see in the area. Um, and so uh, why is it that this one was demolished? And um, the, it, it kind of all goes back to that transaction that made it so that the owner operators of the Laurel Cemetery in the 1930s were these real estate dealers. And um, the, the real estate dealer who initially bought the land in 1931 and, and the cemetery corporation had passed away. 
and his partner, John Kaufman, uh, came into ownership of the, the land in the corporation. And he went into bankruptcy. He, again, he was not really interested in maintaining or operating a cemetery and claims that from the time they took ownership that they never sold any more plots and, and, and never really were operating as a cemetery anymore. So eventually he declared bankruptcy in 1952 um, at which time he presented 11 volumes of the records of, of everyone who was buried at the cemetery and all of the transactions. Um, it actually took five years before that bankruptcy case was closed. But in that time, he um, started a partnership with two uh, lawyers who were um, employed by the Baltimore City Solicitor's Office in the real estate division, Lloyd McAllister and Clement Mercado. And the three of them formed a real estate company which uh, combined their three names to form McCamer. And once the land, they, they kind of concocted a plan for what to do with that land after it was declared bankrupt. And part of that re, uh, uh, plan of theirs required that um, there had to be some sort of provision or some sort of legal mechanism to declare the cemetery abandoned. And so in um, 1956, Although they deny they had a hand in writing this bill, there's some allegations that, that they did. Um, but regardless, the state, um, uh, 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 the state assembly passed this law in 1957 that said if a cemetery could be shown to be 75% abandoned, then it could be closed and the land could be, uh, um, the cemetery could be removed and then the land could be used for other purposes. Um, so. At, once that went through, this McCamer real estate company offered to buy the land, which was now deemed to be valueless because it was just an abandoned cemetery uh, for $100. And one of the things that happened in that, during that time as well was that by 1957, those 11 volumes of records went missing. They disappeared. Um, and uh, we argue that th they were intentionally uh, de destroyed because um, by not having the records, they were able to argue in court, which they did argue in court, that they were unable to get in touch with any of the descendants. Uh, we know from testimony um, that, in fact, they were in contact with several descendants. There was a, a, a an association of people who were volunteering their time and efforts to maintain the cemetery during this time. They'd offered to purchase the land um, and were sort of uh, uh, not being cooperated with by Kaufman uh, and the owners at this time. So there was no awareness in the community that the cemetery was going to be demolished until in um, 1958 when bulldozers show up and start bulldozing the cemetery, at which point there was a, a huge outcry and a big um, uh, a lot of coverage in the newspaper and a slurry of um, or a slew of lawsuits were filed in order to halt this uh, this demolition process. And there were about three years where these court cases are being, excuse me, argued and appealed. And eventually the NAACP got involved and provided um, lawyers and, and funding to appeal the decisions. Um, that had initially been thrown out. Um, but ultimately, they were not successful in, in halting this plan, specifically because the law had been passed that made what they were doing technically legal. And so while they were able to argue successfully in court that, the, uh, um, that they had sort of defrauded the community and misled the community, the only thing at issue in the appeal was whether they had defrauded the court. And they couldn't prove that they had defrauded the court, and so there was this, uh, you know, this great feeling of unfairness surrounding um, these decisions and, and a lack of justice. But part of what then happened was a removing of the cemetery. And if you look at the public uh, record at the time, um, what happened to Laurel Cemetery, as reported in the newspaper, was it was moved to Carroll County. Um, but one of the things we came across in our in our uh, research was that this removing of the cemetery was very likely a haphazard operation. It wasn't done carefully, and it was done on the cheap. Uh, they they spent fifteen thousand dollars to move the cemetery, whereas it had been estimated by the city 
10 years earlier that it would probably cost about $325,000. And some testimony from the time indicates that what was really moved was headstones and the bodies were still interred at that initial area, that there, were, there was no exhuming of the bodies and removing of the bodies. And here you can see some images, 1926 when the cemetery was still in operation. Um, and then 1952 at the tail end of when it was in operation, already par parts of the original cemetery have been sold off by various owners. And then the bulldozers in coming in in 1958, and this is uh, here is a, a uh, uh, this is the Carroll County where they're uh, installing the headstones. And then in 1962, after the appeals, they come in and grade the area. And then they, uh, those three uh, individuals um, signed a deal to lease the land to um, uh, the two guys department store who leased it from 1966 up till 1976, at which point they bought the land for $633,000, um, which pay, was paid to, again, those three individuals, um, became a realty. Um, and if you, if you adjust that for inflation, it's about $4 million, um, $4 million. And so today, this is where the Foreman Mills Cemetery was. So what we wanted to do as archaeologists was to determine if there was still intact burials. So when they did that grading, when they did that demolition, did they destroy all the burials or did they just smooth over the, the land surface? And that means that the burials would still be intact um, under the surface, which is uh, fairly common, especially when we're dealing with deep burials. And so in the remaining green spaces, um, Ron Costanzo over at University of Baltimore and Dr. Elgin Clue over at Coppin State brought students out to conduct excavations that were just determined uh, just um, geared towards determining if there were these intact burials or if everything had been demolished and removed. And what they found was indeed intact burials. Um, uh, the coffin hardware, as you can see here, in situ, in place um, with the remains of coffins, uh, uh, um, at least in that area, in this green space. And we weren't fully exhuming the bodies. We were just confirming that they were still there. And what you can see in the bottom here is a technique we use called ground penetrating radar, where we can use um, this, this high intensity radar to um, probe beneath the surface in places where we can't excavate. And it, it gives us uh, an indication of uh, changes in soil density. And so any place you can see these curves in this, in this image here, that's where the uh, radar is getting bounced back a, in a way that is a, a discontinuity in soil. And so this is ex the exact pattern you expect to see in a burial uh, ground at, at the exact depth. And so th this was taken underneath the parking lot, which also indicates that burials are still intact under the parking lot. And one of the things we, we, we learned was that people were just very much not aware of, of either Laurel Cemetery's existence. And if they were, they were under the impression that it had been moved and that there were no longer bodies. And clearly that, that was not the, the case. And so a big part of our efforts have been to raise awareness about this and in the future to construct, we're working right now with the city actually hopefully to build a memorial at the site. We acquired some grant funding to build that memorial as well. But one of the problems is that those records of who was buried there were gone. And so this is where the other part of our research comes in and our collaboration with BOGS, the Baltimore chapter of the Afro-American um, Historical and Genealogical Society, where the only way to figure out who the individuals were that were buried there is to comb through the death certificates. Um, uh, at the archives of Baltimore. And they started taking death certificates in 1875. So this first 25 years, we don't have records for. But if you go through all the death certificates um, and you know there's reams and reams of microfilm and, and many of them are digitized. Um, and we just look for the ones that indicate Laurel Cemetery is the place of burial. And then we transcribe that information. So it's a tedious process, but we have a big volunteer group that's been doing this for a few years now. And so far we've compiled 16,000 names, um, which is kind of significant because at the time, the reporting in the news, you saw different estimates of how many people were buried there that ranged between like 800 and 5,000 was the biggest estimate we saw. They consistently underestimated how many people were buried there. 
Um, so far, we found 16,000, but given that we've only searched about 20% of the records, we estimate based on what we know about the history of the cemetery that when we're done with this search, we'll, we'll, we'll have between 40 and maybe 45,000 names at minimum. So a lot more people than, uh, than anybody was really aware of. And the, um, this database of names, we also record their occupation, their place of birth, um, cause of death. And so we've been compiling this database, which in and of itself becomes another research for better understanding the history of Baltimore and the history of specifically the African American community. And I just wanted to show you, this is just a screen capture of a map. What we were able to do was uh, input the database into this mapping software based on street address to show where people lived. And then you can search this, for example, um, I, uh, I, I, you're having this talk about the caulkers uh, in, uh, in Baltimore. So I did a search for the occupation caulker and these red dots are the places where uh, people listed as caulkers had lived. And you can search for occupation uh, and you can look at changing demographics um, uh, through time in Baltimore and see uh, evidence of segregated neighborhoods in different parts of Baltimore. And so this is another kind of ongoing part of our research. Um, and I, I, I'm probably approaching the end of the time we have for today. There's a lot more to tell. And so if you're interested, please join us on the 12th. Also, we are working on a book that's going to be published uh, by Roman and Littlefield that's going to tell the whole story. And it's uh, uh, several authors are contributing chapters to that um, book. So that will be there as well. And I want to also mention that we have a nonprofit organization that's raising money to construct the memorial at the site with historic interpretive signage. And although we have some grant money, we are still seeking donations. So if anybody's interested in supporting that um, effort, at this moment, we can only accept um, checks as donations, but we are working on um, getting an uh, electronic um, donation portal up. But um, I suppose with that, I would open it up to any questions you might have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Isaac. That was such an excellent overview. And I just want everyone to know, I put in the chat um, more information about the May 12th talk and um, where you can donate uh, to the Laurel Cemetery Memorial Project if you'd like. So to get into some questions, um, are there records indicating which grave went where at the other cemetery? Um, in Carroll County? Well, so the headstones, we, we have the names that are on the headstones, but the question is whether the bodies are truly associated with the names. We don't have any confidence that the remains truly match those individuals. Another problem is that um, one of the things that was very common at the time was for people to purchase family plots. And so you might have a headstone that says, you know, the family X, you know, family X buried here, and but they might not have markers for each individual. And so, um, Knowing what I know about archaeological excavation, I mean, it's a, it would be very, it'd be possible, but very difficult to um, associate individual bodies with headstones. But it's very clear that they did not make that effort um, when they were moving it. So, um, we we do have a record of the name of the headstones, but um, uh, it's unclear how how meaningful that is. And um, just sort of another question about the Carroll County site. Uh, how is the cemetery arranged and what's the site like today? Um, so yeah, today it is not in great shape, unfortunately. It's sort of in a forested area that it's uh, uh, surrounded by residential area and there's little uh, awareness, I think, that it's a cemetery. There's certainly no signage. Um, there have been some efforts to go out there and clean it up over the years, including very recently. Um, I, there's, we're, we've sort of generated some renewed interest in, in maintaining that site. And we're also looking at getting a highway, a state highway, like historic sign marker out there. We're in the process of submitting that application as well. Um, so uh, if, if you didn't know to look for it though, you would never see it because it's, it's sort of obscured from, from the public view by, um, by overgrowth and forest. Okay, um, and the the law that was created in 1957 that set up a cemetery was quote unquote abandoned. It could be repurposed. Um, is that law still in effect today? 
you know? No, no. I, I think I think what happened was they um, did a revised Maryland. Um, I, I knew this at one time, but they did like a revised Maryland code and they sort of purged some like some laws at that time. Um, I'm not a legal expert, but I, I believe that another law kind of replaced that. Um, there are members of our team who are legal experts. Um, Beverly Carter, I would, I'm not sure if she's in the, in the chat, she might be able to um, answer that better, but um, uh, it, it, it's not still in fact. And the other thing is that in um, 1966, the National Historic Preservation Act was passed, which would have protected uh, potentially Laurel Cemetery in the first place. Um, and uh, a, a whole host of other laws have, um, have, have been passed since then that, that would have perhaps provided some protection or oversight, but, but not in the 1950s, unfortunately. Wonderful, thank you. Um, two more about sort of the Carroll County, oh, uh, multiple things. Uh, is the Daniel Payne Memorial at the Carroll County site? No, so the Daniel Payne Memorial, uh, along with another memorial, are at Mount Zion Cemetery. Mm -hmm. And we've been trying to figure out exactly how they came to be there. Um, there are a few conflicting records, uh, in at least in newspaper records, and we weren't able to find a, a, an official sort of narrative about how it came to be there, um, but it is unfortunately in a state of disrepair. Um, but so that is at Mount Zion. And then there's a, a handful of um, uh, um, graves that were moved to Arbutus. And I'm struggling to remember the name of the cemetery in Arbutus. Um, we can look it up on the website. Okay. Um, but um, uh, where is Mount Zion Cemetery? Do you know? I think it's in uh, West Baltimore. Oh. Elgin just, yeah, lands down. Oh, lands um, down. And um, so uh, I just want to acknowledge that there's people also sharing their own memories and about their family members learning about the site. Um, I will put the, the website in the chat, but is there, can we, sh if, if people would like to share their stories about Laurel Cemetery and their own experiences, yeah. how do there's we make a, that happen? Yeah, there, at our website, there's a contact us. Um, area where you can put in your name and, and you can send a message and that sends an email directly to us, um, which we should probably check soon. Um, okay, so but yeah, that but it also has the contact information for myself and Elgin, who's the other uh, and Ron, who you can also email directly uh, with that. But um, uh, all that information is on our website. And we would love to hear those stories. Absolutely. Wonderful. We would definitely welcome that. Um, okay. okay. Uh, were there were there any other questions? Um, we just wanted someone wanted to know who owns the um, Carroll County site. So the uh, court appointed uh, a gentleman Edward Anderson to be the uh, trustee to oversee the moving. Um, he was in business with those with the McCamer folks, um, but I guess he was uh, deemed to be an outside party. He bought the land on behalf of them, and the, but he died in the 70s. And the title for the land, we looked in the land records, still has him listed. Um, but it has some kind of protected status by the, um, by the county. Um, so if someone wanted to buy that land, I don't think it would be able to be for sale, um, but that's the, that's the only information we have. So right now it still lists a deceased man as the, as the owner. And then it, again, it has this um, somewhat protected status um, uh, it, acknowledged by the county. They bought it from a farmer um, in Carroll County and, and actually the son of that farmer assisted in, in uh, uh, moving the headstones and then gave testimonial about what happened later on. That's one of the ways we know about um, um, what, what happened when the, the headstones were being moved. Got it. Okay. Well, we're at 135. We're five minutes over. Um, so I just want to say thank you again, Isaac, for being here. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Laurel Cemetery, including the plans to build a memorial on the site at um, on Bel Air Road, uh, you can come and hear from Isaac and a lot of the other integral players in the um, 
Laurel Cemetery Memorial Project on May 12th. Um, and thank you again for being here. All right, thank you all very much. And thanks again for having me.